So welcome to lecture number 10. Oh, already quite progressed and today, we, last week we had the black holes and came at the end towards the supermassive black holes. So almost each galaxy we know has in its center a supermassive black hole. And today we're going to talk basically about around the structures surrounding this. So start at the top. So hopefully recording is going on. No, not really. Ah, oh, that's why. Okay. So oh, let's go back and share. Sorry for this delays. So it pointer. Now I'm ready. So do we talk about galaxies? Accumulation of star systems bound together by mutual gravity. And we've got to talk about shapes, ages, evolution of them, maybe. And maybe how many are there? So a few questions. And then uh, towards the end, we come back to our own one, uh, our Milky Way. And then we're going to also discuss whether we need the Milky Way Independence Party. Who knows? Maybe somebody from Andromeda wants to come and, and do whatever here. OK, so. By now, you're very familiar with this type of plot. You know, the very early universe, the first couple of minutes, and then the first 380,000 years, and the decoupling when the de soup of charged particle, this pl original plasma, became basically you know, uh, a gas of neutral atoms and maybe even molecules. And that led to the dark ages. And we assume after 200,000 years, uh, 200 million years, sorry. Oh, <laughs> so about 200 million years that then the first stars formed. And then later on, the star system started to form galaxies. So, <clears throat> and then we have seen basically that throughout time, well, we had here these uh, freckles, if you remember. We had these freckles in the cosmic microwave background, which where the dark spots or the blue spots corresponds to colder, less photons, more dark matter. That this dark matter forms, gives us the original seeds for the matter distribution as we observe it nowadays. So, so basically here through time that ending up nowadays, we have these galaxy clusters consisting then of individual galaxies. And these empty voids and so, so the structural formation that we already discussed. And then, the, well, in these galaxy clusters, of course, the individual galaxies and the individual galaxies must co consist of star systems. Our star system, our own one and other ones, we're going to discuss next week and then the last week of this lecture course or of this module. So, oh. So again, to just to give you a feeling, you know, the first, so 200 to 400 million years after the Big Bang, we have the first generation of stars forming. Well, they must be relatively big because the, the original uh, nebula must have been relatively dense. The universe was still relatively small compared to nowadays. So everything was a bit more cramped together. 
Of course, if they were big, they quickly become nova or some might even directly, uh, if you have too much material around above 130 solar mass, there is not much of a star, the gas cloud collab collapses immediately to a black hole. The wood gets black holes around. And they have, of course, loads to feast and quickly form supermassive black holes. And then, whether around them or uh, whether previously already structure formation has started or structure formation of stars around these black holes, this is still a question the experiment will answer. Why? What is the problem? Well, we remember that light emitted about 400 million years after the Big Bang will be drastically redshifted due to the expansion of space. So take our wave and then we expand space and the wavelength gets longer and longer. So the wave or the light that we now observe corresponds with the emitted light with the redshift plus one. So if we start with ultraviolet 100 nanometers and have a redshift of 10, Z equals 10, then we get basically 1100 nanometers out. 100 nanometers is in the ultraviolet, 1100 nanometers well, is now in the infrared. So most of the stuff from light from this time is so heavily redshifted that it will be in the infrared. Well, so give you a feeling again. So typical redshifts. So this curve here, and then we take half a million years after the Big Bang. So here the age of the universe, half a year of the Big Bang, we get a redshift of about 10. Just uh, the scenario we just had. Then if we go to 1.5 billion years, so G for giga, billion years, we have a redshift of 4.1. What means? 4.1 plus 1, 5.1. Again, if we start with this 100 nanometers ultraviolet, we come to 510 nanometers. I think that should be greenish light or orange light. Oh, no, but 700 is red, 590 is yellowish. Yeah, that should be greenish. If you start with 200 nanometers, so still ultraviolet multiplied with 5.1, we are 1,000 nanometer roughly. We are again ending up in the infrared. Visible light clearly. So in order to see this stuff, we often need to, to have a rather infrared capabilities or eyes that work in the infrared, basically to take the snakes into sp space and let them look. As most or oh, many snakes are hunting at night, there it's beneficial to see the infrared. You immediately see the heat signatures. Oh, this is military uh, night. Google's infrared. So, if we look with normal light, we come maybe to, to one and a half, two billion years after the Big Bang. If we want to look at this light of the first star, what has been done is with Spitzer Space Telescope. But Spitzer has a terrible resolution. Even uh, if you look further, well, you remember Kobe, the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer, the first of the three uh, satellites that were mapping the cosmic microwave background. So Big Bang, microwave, dark ages, the first light. And then the structure evolution until today. So obviously, since Spitzer doesn't have the resolution, 
how resolution matters. If you remember this uh, slide, where these three microwave uh, satellites, the resolution is shown with this picture with the lady. So this, oh, which I should replace at some point with something more gender neutral. So obviously, Spitzer is not good enough. That's why the James Webb Space Telescope is designed exactly for this task. The light of the first stars with a good resolution. Of course, has this been attempted to observe this stuff? What we do for such a task, of course, uh, because it's faint, it's infrared, infrared uh, makes water molecules vibrate. So the, the hydrogen vibrates against the oxygen. Oh, what can we do? So we cannot observe here on the Earth because it's absorbed in the atmosphere. We need to go beyond. And there was basically uh, one of the directors. Well, Apple basically uh, has also board of directors, scientific committee here, scientific committee there, and there are plenty of these committees. Often it's necessary because you have an instrument which is very rare, and many people want to have observation time. You need to have some mechanism to filter what is interesting, what is less interesting. So <clears throat> you have to form a scientific committee that you need some directors that represent this also towards the politicians and so on. And seemingly these directors, when they serve a certain time, they got it also observation time for themselves. So if you serve three years, you get two weeks or so. And one of these guys said, why not look into the nothing? Usually if you if you apply uh, for, for observation time and say, I want to look at the darkest point of the night sky. Everybody says that's a complete waste of observation time. Forget about it. This guy, he had the right to say, I want to see, look into the darkest spot in the night sky. Where do we find this? So this is then how the Hubble deep field picture was taken. It's basically we look from here now and look back to roughly a billion years already quite redshifted. We need, Kappel has also a bit of infrared. We might come to a certain degree. Where is the darkest point in the night sky? It's somewhere here in the constellation of the Great Bear. So here, you know, the, the Plach. If you follow this here, you should end up somewhere here at the Pols Polar or Polaris, the North Star. And somewhere here must be the, the darkest spot in the night sky. So what you do now, you take your telescope, take it for two weeks and have observing it, or at least uh, fractions of, smaller fractions of it, observe it for a good long time with a good long exposure time in the darkest point in the night sky. And you saw this, this picture, the Hubble deep field. What you see here is corresponds roughly to an opening angle. So if you observe from here, this is the part in the night sky that you observe. This corresponds to 2.6 arc minutes. It's if you take the entire sphere of the surface around us, this corresponds to one of 72 million, over 72 million parts of the night sky. So a very tiny fraction of the night sky. In fact, what we get in here are two stars. 
you see here this twinkling here and this twinkling here. Why do they twink? It's the optics because the, op the telescope has been now focused for the distance and then what is near gets blurry. So the stuff in our own galaxy gets blurry. So easily identified with this blinking or twinkling. So it has been, this picture has been taken of 342 individual pictures, total exposure time of 10 days. Right. And you always need to, to adjust and then maybe you come to the dark, uh, at the daytime and so on. So you, then you need to refocus. And if you would do it while uh, still uh, having the exposure time, then, uh, so yet that's about 10 days so we can imagine uh how long will this be 10 days 240 hours or 40 minutes or so per, per shot so where is this stuff again again well i wouldn't find here much stars so this what you see here this corresponds to an opening angle of one degree. By the way, one, one degree. So take the circle, chop it into 360 pieces, like, okay. Then you take one of these pieces and chop it into 60, then you are down at half minutes. Very small angle. So this here is now one uh, degree opening angle, and then the picture that you see here is basically this small fraction. The next is you take this picture that you obtain, you print it on a very big paper, you take the PhD student, or to, you print it three, four times, you take three, four PhD students, give each of them a black marker, <laughs> And one of these clickers where when you count, you click on. You know, then you let the students basically on this printout find every spot on this picture, color it black, and click. So basically count what you see. What you see here, except of these two stars, every dot is a galaxy. This tiny part of what of the night sky, <laughs> you see all these galaxies. Wow. <laughs> well, and if the PhD students do that job well, you come to roughly 3,000 uh, light dots on this picture. What means we don't know how much of the fraction of the total sphere surrounding us. We know how much stuff is in there. We can calculate easily the total number of galaxies. Doing so, we end up with 210 giga or 210 billion galaxies. 2.1102011. Galaxies. And now you think that each galaxy is. So Milky Way is, of, of course, a bit uh, above average. So it means we have 200, 100 to 400 million stars. So if you assume 100 billion stars per galaxy, 100, let's see, 10 to the 11, that means 10 to the 22 stars, 2.1, 10 to the 22 stars. Oh, quite something. Well, the next thing is what we can do. We can look at the individual shapes. We can zoom in, but then look into the shapes of these uh, uh, individual galaxies. And here we see something. This is big, but very elliptical. Then we see here one that is clearly, if you take a close look, this is clearly some spiral. 
here subspiral, here subspiral, here subspiral. Then we see basically a couple of types repeating of these shapes. So looking again, well, here you see clearly the optics of a star, but here next to, we have basically some disc-like structure. Here's a disc-like structure, but here we see a bar and then two of these uh, uh, spiral arms. Then we see we get spirals, we get some irregular stuff. We get a lot of elliptical. So this here seems to be more elliptical. We get barrel spirals and some with peculiar shape. So that's something. But now we can, of course, say uh, in what we have observed so far. It's a bit nonsense because we have now looked at one very peculiar part of the night sky. Is this really uh, representative of the other 72 million parts? And by the way, this happened, this Hubble Alpha Deep Field in the middle of the 90s. Then there were repair missions sent to Hubble and also scientific instruments were upgraded. So one of the visible lights was kicked out and replaced with infrared capabilities. And part strong motivation was this Hubble deep field. And then with this enhanced ultra uh, infrared, one can of course look deeper. This is then the Hubble Ultra Deep Field photograph or this 700 million years after the Big Bang, maybe 400. So then one would have to, to kick the light of the first galaxies even further and the light of the first stars also a bit further towards the uh, uh, microwave background or the dark ages become less extended. So this was now taken at the constellation of Fornax, wherever Fornax is, so I would never find this here. Probably it's because it's also the sky. <laughs> this picture is a bit bollocks that Hubble is looking over North America. Okay, so, so here now, what one did, with the four different cameras, the same picture, for the same pictures, so ultraviolet blue 435. So this is what we just can see as bluish purple. Then 606 nanometer instrument, which is yellowish. And then 775, this is red in near infrared and 850 nanometers, again, near infrared. You see that the exposures time is the total exposures that were given. The total exposure time, you see here, it's a bit more, well, there you get very likely more objects that are more distant, what means they must be fainter. It's the angle that we, the star towards us has become so smaller and smaller, the opening angle. Then we get this picture shown here on the left side. Here again, a star. I think there are more in, but we would have to check. And the very interesting thing is, if one takes a close look here, it's a red dot here, red dots, very reddish dots. Oops, so it's very reddish dots. Looking here, this becomes the interesting when one looks at the different spectral parts. One can also use this basically from to combine this different picture and then one can extract the redshift. Using this redshift to, to time and distance curve, no. Oh, we can roughly say when this light started to be in the universe and traveling towards us. 
So if we take a look at the visible, we see nicely this galaxy. If we take a near infrared, we see now this dot coming up. So basically this near infrared by Hubble. Dedicated for the infrared region is the Spitzer Space Telescope. So, but you see now the resolution. Basically, what sees here, there's a galaxy, okay, there's a, some hotspot with a round. And what sees a bit here, again, this dot. Then, of course, one can uh, fake and combine everything. Then, more nicely, has this galaxy. <coughs> oh, both galaxies in the same picture. So, what you see, have seen beforehand, is obviously a combination of different wavelengths, different cameras. So now we take here this close look and compare also with the infrared. And then we see a couple of, or relatively many, of very, very redshifted spots. Obviously, the Resolution is not good enough to, to see there much of structure, but to see there is something. So we would need to go closer and closer to see more and more of the structure. Oh, then we can look now with this comparison set equal seven, set equal eight redshifted uh, galaxies. Or well, set equal seven. Set equal eight, if we go here, go over, come down, it should be the 700, 800,000 years after the Big Bang. That is the ultra deep field. Cool. So we are coming closer. So we look basically, this light was traveling for 13 billion years. In the universe, that is only 13.8 billion years. Oh, oh, for me, quite impressive thoughts. But then, of course, we can now this compare. How many do we observe? How intense are these, these, these spots? Oh, we can now start to compare with models. If you remember for this big, big structure, there was this ball showing. It's Russian word for big. Uh, I wonder whether this simulation gets to be renamed. So, <clears throat> which worked relatively well to describe the big structures. It also describes relatively well this, this the evolution of spiral galaxies and barred spiral galaxies. And this time, the becoming of elliptical galaxies and irregulars in between. So we can compare now what we observe to these models, to the simulations. But again, to give you the outlook for the future or the near future now. So ground-based, we make it maybe back to, to redshifts of one. Now we might be even better because of this picture here. This is obviously so after 2010, but probably already a couple of years old. I don't think I have ever replaced it in the four or five years where I give this module. So I should look up for a new one, what the ground based gifts now. Perhaps it's should come at least uh, when the near infrared starts, when the atmosphere starts to block out the infrared light. Well, the, the deep field, redshift of four, so 1.5 billion years, then the Hubble ultra, ultra deep field, so the seven or maybe even eight in the redshift, so this. 800, 700 million years. Then the infrared, 
ultra deep field they claim though up to 10 480 million years after the big bang and now james webb space telescope that is capable to observe redshifted objects was more than 20 redshifts so 200 million years after the big bang the light of the first stars and galaxies so then we can of course use now this observation though this is a bit tricky the time axis here was the big bang and then we go left with and zero bits nowadays so this is the time backwards so again obviously uh, you see that most of these pictures are leaked from ESA and NASA just for me because they are very nice because they say for educational purposes there is no copyright what I think should be because we are taxpayer paid entity they are taxpayer paid entity so it's the same part of money that if we start shuffling now from the universities to ESA then oh, it becomes a bit a uh, lot of administration that the repurpose of the taxpayers money is then to patient oh a multitude of administrators oh, only for this uh, it must be because i have a bit of a cold okay so we have here these dots and then this time we start seeing there is some structure of course it's blurry because it's very far away it will be very interesting how this really happened whether the simulations are good and then what is nice here shown if one calculates the redshift away so correct for the redshift the early universe was small everything was dense which means we had more bigger stars and less smaller stars and nowadays everything is a bit more diffuse it means the birth of big stars is reduced compared to back then and the birth of smaller stars reddish ones is more enhanced what does this mean back then basically the universe was a bit more shining a bit more blue while nowadays it turns to become more and more reddish. So color evolution of the universe. But then the opposite to what we usually have as color feeling, that, uh, we have been taught that blue is cold and red is hot. We have to swap this again around. Yeah, red is cold and blue is hot. be interesting if one takes a thousand kids and isolates them from the rest of society whether that changes this color coding in their education whether this is then or whether this is already uh, uh, it, in us by birth or whether this is just educated i can tell you it's quite funny if you ever travel to bulgaria because in Bulgaria, if you want to say yes, you shake your head. If you want to say no, you don't. Then try to, to communicate. Back then I was a smoker and I wanted to the kiosk to buy me some cigarettes. And the lady pointed at someone and I said, yes, 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 da, da, da. And she just shrugged the shoulders and pointed to the next some point I realized, oh yeah, it's this stupid, <laughs> or oh, it's this reversed habit. But obviously for Bulgarians, it's completely normal to, to have the different uh, way. Okay, that was enough of psychology. We are here for astronomy. So basically we are getting redder. Away from blue. What is football football wise great sick okay now basically 
have seen the historical fraction. How about the dates? If you look at this nice picture of this spiral galaxy, which is not so far away, 12 billion light years, so that's basically neighborhood. This has three different dates. It's M81 or NGC 3031 or Modis galaxy. Why? <laughs> well, why these names like M81 or NGC 3031? And what do they mean? Well, the last name is clear. Bodes galaxy, that sounds like any guy has uh, discovered it. And then uh, back then, of course, he didn't make a photograph. <laughs> because he discovered it at the December uh, 31st, what means Sylvester night or Hogmanay. 1774. There you were basically sitting at your telescope that adjusted it and then you painted what you see. If you couldn't paint, you didn't got famous. Okay, so the guy was Johann Ehler Bode. Okay, then Messier or M81 stands for. It's entry number 81 in the Messier catalog, which has been made 1771. So obviously Messier had already before said there is an object. Bode was lucky. Or the catalog was up to then only at, at entry 80 and then Somehow, Messier heard about this, this, this new nebula. Because what Messier did, he just uh, uh, cataloged nebula. You remember that we were talking about Hubble, at the Hubble constant. Hubble was the guy who said Andromeda must be a galaxy on its own. It's too far away because of these C5 variables. There must be galaxies. But all nebulas are just accumulation of gas, they are accumulation of stars outside of our Milky Way. So Messier basically cataloged nebula. Oh, whether this was it already known before this guy came along, or whether it was later entered, I have no clue. Well, or it's entry number 3031 in the new general catalog, which has been made 1880. I'm pretty sure that this must be then uh, continuously expanded since then. So this here is this Charles Bessier, and obviously he looks like a typical uh, noble at this time. So, Oh, I don't even know whether it's French or English, but I would suspect he's French. What means that uh, very likely it's 1791. This came here to add further entries clear, came to an abrupt halt that Mr. VUT uh, executed his, his invention. Well, the Messier catalog. Anyway, it contains 107 objects. And what it contains is galaxies as well as just nebula. So back then, these were all just diffuse objects. So you couldn't really resolve it, it all was just defined as a nebula. But that's where, if we have M74, so this must be somewhere here. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, four. Oh, oh, not even a stupid picture. I would have made it in blocks of 10, but who am I to criticize? Okay. Nevertheless, we have previously already seen, so we don't know where these names come from. 
that of course special dates like a trovida, the object has is visible with the pure eye. So I'm pretty sure that there were our ancestors when they left Africa, maybe 100,000, maybe 150 or 200,000 years ago. They, I'm pretty sure they were also sitting at, at night there and looking up in the sky and have seen it. And certainly they gave the things names. Oh, so the names hopefully clear. And then we have seen there are different shapes of galaxies. So we have seen the spiral galaxies, irregulars, and elliptical galaxies. But here are pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Galaxies, of course, when we want to observe galaxies, there's always the problem. How are they oriented towards us? How are they in space compared to us? This is, of course, uh, randomly, you can go with now. You can have a pure look on it, or you can have the orientation in the light of sight. Of course, if you see my head fully, you see there are five fingers attached. If you just see it from a certain angle, you see, just see one finger. It's hard to tell that more. So, but give the number of samples we have, and there, remember these 210 billion galaxies. Oh. <laughs> There's obviously enough there to, that whatever kind they have, they might be lying nicely in the line of sight towards us. But what we also see here is, for example, that's whether this is already a galaxy or just a globular cluster. But you see all these different shapes. Here's something irregular, here's something more almost spherical, but still a bit elliptical. This here is a nice uh, disk like with a gas around that blocks a bit of light. That's the Mexican head galaxy or the Sombrero galaxy. A nicely uh, a spiral one, and then the spiral one have occasionally this arm, uh, this bar in the center. And since he was the first one to discover the R galaxies, the first one really to be able to look at because he had the instrument in the in this uh, observatory that was Hubble that classified the stuff. So Hubble, right, basically, depending on the shape, uh, elliptic or define them either as elliptical galaxies, and then an ellipse, we can always define it's basically a sphere is a special case of an ellipse where all three semi major axes are equal. Then we can define with we have what is called oblate where one axis is shorter than the other two. This is the discus-like shape. Or one is longer than the other two. We would call this prolate. And then, of course, triaxle. These are the, the extremes. But now the eccentricity, what means the, the ratio of basically one axis to the other two, this is what Hubble used to, to classify the ellipticals. We have seen nicely the spiral galaxies, and depending on how their arms are, how close they are lying, how spread out they are, again, some classification. But then we have seen these barred spirals. And some intermediate ones, and of course, classify somewhere the irregular ones. So then out here. So this is what uh, basically he made a catalog, but this is the Hubble classification. Okay. Beside the redshift, there might be other observables that we can look at. Like for example, how much hydrogen gas is there? 
Why is this interesting? Well, without hydrogen gas, we won't form much new stars. So this is one thing. How, how rich is this in the heavy chemical elements? What means in the classification of the astronomers, we are back to this <laughs> periodic table with three elements, hydrogen, helium, metals. Well, so how much metal is there? The metallicity of a star as, as a classification for the age. So there are a couple of things that we can do, but I would say, well, no, we do this now in the next slide. And then you can have a nice look at this uh, uh, video here. Oh, no, I forgot to check which one it was. It was you have to scroll a bit down about the third video or so. Where you nicely see light coming from a distant galaxy, hitting the primary mirror of a telescope, going via this, instead of a secondary and reflected directly into a spectroscopic or into a scientific instrument, a spectrometer, where the light is then split up into its components. And then we get, after it's split up in the components, basically the intensity or flux here, the number of particles per time, sure given area, the given area is obviously defined by our mirror for, from a given object. And here is plotted the wavelengths. In Angström, uh, ten Angström correspond to one nanometer. So it's ten to the minus ten meters. Ten to the minus ten is a great number. Everything with ten, I have ten fingers. You have ten. Most of you have ten fingers. Uh, my grandpa didn't have ten fingers, but he was a, a joiner. And then they used to have a non intention number of fingers. Oh, this, of course, crap when you go in the pub and say, five beers for the boys from the sawmill. So, but times before health and safety. Well, and then the intensity over the wavelengths, we get nicely again what is there. H alpha, what's hydrogen, here's some sodium next to S sulfur, magnesium, sodium, H is gamma, is again a hydrogen. And the same stuff here, just uh, measured in absorption. So basically, if there's some gas, where we are interested in, the absorption would be the good quantity to measure. So everything that comes, except of the, when you have the gas, when you excite the atom, but then it de-excites and emits the radiation at the other side. When you have a source of light, the gas in between, this was this absorption measurement. Well, so we would look at the luminosity of a galaxy. So how bright is it? But then we take the redshift, we normalize for the distance. Or if we observe the type one supernova, but then we see how much visible matter, what is usually the called baryonic matter, is there. That second, we can from this spectrum, we directly get the metallicity, what means the other stuff in comparison to hydrogen. So, it means gives us a, a feeling for the chemical evolution. This here is really a nice film, so I should be the third or fourth one. Sorry, I can't. Oh, the other hand, it's uh, it's not YouTube, so YouTube might be generous. So let's have a try. No, well, what I F L S means is I an obscene word, laugh science. Very good website. Oops. 
very nicely explaining things and that if you go here for this uh, rainbow fingerprints, unfortunately it's on YouTube, so if I open this now, I get problems. So please take a look. Of course, uh, what we also get from here is the redshift directly again. So I quit this now. So please take a look at this and then we continue after a break. We we'll also need a uh, new coffee. We continue with these observables for galaxies and about the structure of galaxies. Oh, see you then in a few minutes.